Thanks to Sakurako and Tokyo Treat for sponsoring this video. What if Nintendo leaked their own game? What if someone inside the company spoiled the surprise just before launch day? It could be a complete disaster. Or it could happen to something like Chibi Robo and no one would really care. Nintendo's had a big problem with leaks over the years, to say the least. Some of their biggest announcements get spoiled just days before that new direct drops, ruining the hype for fans and hurting the company's bottom line in the process. Or maybe not. What if a game got leaked on purpose? And not just once, but have it happen multiple times. Yeah, I know you're probably thinking, why would Nintendo want to do something like that? I mean, I know this is the same company that thought selling us cardboard was a good idea, but okay, they're not that dumb to take away all this fan excitement, right? Would there be any advantage? Would it actually be a good thing to have an important announcement leak early? We're gonna examine the real reasons why Nintendo themselves let loose several controversial reveals ahead of time, released a full game early by accident, and may have even leaked a major game that never existed at all? What? We've seen big leaks with Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, the best Pokemon games, am I right? With images and details being leaked about the games on April 1st, so yeah, nobody really thought they were real. But there were some conspiracy theories going around throughout the community believing that Nintendo intentionally let this leak slip. You see, at E3 the year before the games would release, they announced that the next mainline Pokemon games would release in 2018, and unless you're that one guy, and yes, I'm talking about that guy, literally everyone expected this to be Generation 8 for the series, actual new Pokemon games. Not another Kanto remake for the millionth time, so what if Nintendo leaked them on purpose to temper expectations? Let the most diehard fans know ahead of time what to expect, so the wave of hate when the games do get announced isn't as bad. Something they probably really wish they did with Federation Force a couple years prior, like, Hey guys, here's the brand new Metroid Prime game, and oh my god, what is this? There's no Samus, they're chibis. What? Like, damage control up front would've really helped in situations like that, and while in this case I definitely don't think Nintendo intentionally leaked their own game here, even with all the logic seeming to line up, because there's a pretty big problem with this. Pokemon doesn't really care that much about hurting our feelings. Newer games are continuously being rushed out with aspects so obviously being unfinished, but the franchise is just so massive in other areas that it doesn't even matter. Do you think a company this big is genuinely worried about what a few people on Twitter say about Sword and Shield's trees in the wild area? I don't think so. They cared enough in this case to address the game they originally promised, but leaking it on purpose seems far-fetched when you consider that leaks like this happen for pretty much every big Pokemon game. It's just a part of the process. Some get blown up and some don't. But I definitely can't say the same for another game that came out the year before. One of the most controversial ideas that we've ever seen in the Mario series. Yes, I'm talking about this. If you told a Mario fan five years ago that their next RPG type game would be a crossover with the Rabbids, yes, these guys, they would have probably spat out whatever they were drinking in disbelief, thrown their Wii Remote at the TV in anger, and then, well, shamefully go and buy a new TV realizing this was all over an announcement of a product they didn't need to buy, but hey, I could get the frustration. With the Paper Mario series going through some, well, let's say ups and downs, and yeah, we'll touch on one of those games in a bit, and the Mario and Luigi series having to stay on the 3DS, there needed to be something new introduced for those turn-based combat fans who were deterred from games like Fire Emblem for, uh, one reason or another. But doing this with characters originating from a Rayman spin-off that are annoying, to say the least, sounded crazy. It couldn't be possible, right? But no, it actually was. This announcement happened at E3 2017, but if you were to go back and examine reaction videos from that time, you'll notice that almost everyone kinda expected this. It was not a surprise. Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle was still a strange concept, but people weren't looking at it like, oh my god, why is Mario with the Rabbids? What is this dumb idea? No, they were kinda looking at it like, hey, I'm not so sure about this, but the combat actually looks pretty good. The game would end up releasing to some positive reception too. Once you got over the idea of it all, it was actually pretty fun to just enjoy running through. But what got people over it so quickly? Oh yeah, the same theory as before, but only this time I don't think we're too far into the wild conspiracy territory for one key reason. 
On May 23rd, just over three weeks before E3, the main cover art of the game, along with some details, leaked from trusted sources. It looked too official to be considered false, and looking back at it now, some of the responses were pretty wild. Just look at this. But with three weeks to go, the fanbase had the time to wait, and wait, and finally accept the idea that this was going to happen. So that instead of just memeing on the game's concept, or worse, entirely hating on it, they could actually look at it with a critical eye. And I feel this is much more important to the success of a highly experimental Nintendo and Ubisoft crossover than it is for a major Pokemon game that wasn't really designed for the core fanbase to begin with. And if you needed any more definitive proof about whether or not this was an intentional strategy, well in June of 2021, it actually happened again. Yup, since the original went over well, a sequel, Mario Plus Rabbids Sparks of Hope was conceived and Nintendo would leak it early once more. The strategy seemed different this time though. While the first time was undoubtedly to temper expectations ahead of an obviously divisive concept, this new one on the other hand was likely leaked to get some Nintendo fans to go and watch the Ubisoft Forward presentation later in the day. Especially considering the leak came directly from Nintendo's website. <laughs> directly, you know I'm good with it. They were really trying to get eyes on this announcement. Eyes that may not have planned on watching that Ubisoft presentation originally. What, you weren't interested in Just Dance 2022? Uh, maybe if it was coming to the Wii. That was still the funniest thing ever, I can't even believe it lasted that long, that was crazy. Nintendo leaked their own game here, and since it happened twice, I think we could either chalk it up to there being more hands involved in the project since it's a collaboration between two companies, or the much more plausible explanation to me that it was leaked on purpose, especially for the first time. But if there was any series more synonymous with leaks than Mario and Pokemon, it's gotta be Smash. The whole deal with the build up till the game's launch and then for its subsequent DLC run was people guessing which new characters would be added to the roster. Will my favorite series finally get a representative? Which series will get more characters? Which ones will be, uh, <laughs> left behind? And what is the fan reaction gonna be like? Oh boy, we all really wanted to see that one. But in September 2019, after getting Banjo and Smash, the official Nintendo of Europe website for the fourth Challenger Pack was created, and in it a mention of copyright belonging to the SNK Corporation was found. This was quite a revelation, as Nintendo had not worked with this company on anything Smash Bros related in the past. SNK was a pretty big company with some history, and had a variety of franchises with one of the most recent big titles being SNK Heroines Tag Team Frenzy for the Switch, which uh, we all enjoyed for the gameplay, right? And some would dismiss this copyright tag as simply being a copy of it due to them being identical in file size. But the biggest flaw in that argument would be, why would that even happen? Why would anyone messing with this one page of Smash Ultimate content have that oddly specific copyright tag copied? It didn't make much sense and was likely just a desperate hope from fans who didn't want this to be true. They didn't want a character from a franchise they, to be blunt, never even heard of joining the roster of Smash. So this story, this theory, was created out of desperation. However, after cross-checking with the other fighter pack listings and Nintendo pulling down the page soon after it went up, it gave further credence to the idea that this SNK copyright was a legitimate leak. And just three days later, Terry from Fatal Fury would be confirmed as the SNK character for Challenger Pack 4 showing that this was real and a pretty big mistake. Many fans were happy, many were not. Many like me who were like, we just got Banjo and Smash, I really don't care about this. But like the previous two games, I feel there was actually a lot of good to come out of this. Everyone had pretty much accepted that an SNK character was coming before the actual reveal happened. Once again, it tempered expectations, and since there was still another character left to go, there wasn't as much of a fuss made as there likely would have been otherwise. But later, we'd find out in a pretty interesting move, Nintendo would announce for the first character in the next pass that an ARMS character would be joining Smash. An announcement made before the presentation took place. And for this to happen, they must have known that what happened with Terry actually helped the situation. Would Terry have been received that negatively without the leak? Probably not, but there was undoubtedly a benefit to tempering expectations here as shown by what Sakurai would go on to do. 
Did Nintendo intentionally make this Terry leak? I doubt it, even though some theorize this as being the case. Mostly because I think that if they were going to do it intentionally, Byleth was definitely the choice over Terry. And series director Masahiro Sakurai has remarked many times over and over that he hates leaks and spoilers. It's his official reasoning for why we don't get a subspace level of campaign mode in Smash games anymore with the beautiful cutscenes, originality, and well, effort, and it doesn't seem like something he'd want done. But the fact is, it happened. But what if Nintendo released the entirety of Smash Ultimate early at some point? What if you put in a pre-order for the game, and weeks before the full game released, you could see every character, stage, feature, and just leak everything? These aren't just leaks being done to temper expectations, this would cause a full-blown catastrophe and a ton would be at stake. But thankfully, it didn't happen to Smash Ultimate. What's likely the worst possible scenario for a company planning a big launch party at least didn't have to be worried about. Probably because it happened two years prior. Yes, a situation like this actually happened before, and it was pretty chaotic. But before I get into that massive leak, I have something of my own that I want to leak. Because I got my hands on the next Sakurako and Tokyo Treat boxes, and I'm going to leak everything right now. Wait, am I even allowed to do this? The response was great for previous boxes that we've showcased, and they're back again with some new stuff. For Tokyo Treat, I got 20 of the latest, most exclusive, limited edition, and seasonal flavored Japanese snacks that are only available in Japan for a limited time. Each month has a unique theme, and June's theme is Summer Matsuri. Piled high with the most exclusive and flavorful snacks that Japan's summer festivals have to offer. I'm gonna be completely honest here, this was my favorite box that I've had yet. I've loved the others, but the Kubo Apple Pie, Premier Lemon Fanta, and dude, the cookies and cream Kit Kat especially put this one over the top for me. I really enjoyed this box, and with the Sakurako one, I got 20 traditional and authentic artisan Japanese snack items, including Japanese teas. And a special Japanese tableware actually comes with the box too. Sakurako helps in partnering with local Japanese snack makers to continue to share Japanese culture and traditions that have been passed down for over a hundred years. It's all authentic and the real deal. June's theme is tea time in Yokohama. And you may have noticed that this box actually has a brand new design for this month. As Sakurako is partnered with the Kanagawa government and local businesses in creating a one-of-a-kind Yokohama-inspired box design to promote traditional Yokohama confectionaries, snacks, and teas. Filled with tons of goodies including their fragrant hojicha, the Yokohama chocolate crunchies, and my favorites the Kamakura cream wafers. Just great stuff. As a Nintendo fan, you probably want to experience some authentic Japanese treats, and I don't blame you. You can help support the channel while trying out some great stuff by using my code SARATH to earn $5 off your first order on either box. Be sure to order by June 30th to ensure you don't miss out. So let's get this right, Nintendo had a full game leak just weeks before it was supposed to come out? Yes, this actually happened, and with the Wii U being such a well unmitigated disaster sales-wise, many forget about some of the most controversial moments in the console's history, especially in 2016 where most people were either getting hyped about the Switch or walking into Area 51 while playing Pokemon Go. The point is, Paper Mario Color Splash didn't get too much attention, and definitely not positive attention at that. All this stuff about Mario fans craving an RPG in 2017 was still a thing the year prior and Paper Mario had taken quite a drastic shift away from its RPG roots around this time. After the GameCube's Thousand Year Door, we get Super on the Wii, which received a mixed response. With the prevailing view sort of being like, hey, I didn't expect this type of game, but it was still pretty good. And then there was Sticker Star. It wasn't an RPG, and simply, well, wasn't good. So people wanted what was familiar, just go back to the old reliable format of being an RPG and when the Paper Mario series director was asked about the future of the series in early 2016, she shockingly said that the next entry in the series was already done development? Uh, what? So Nintendo's just been hiding this game the whole time? Fans wanted to get some gameplay first though. We needed to find out if this game was taking the new route or going back to the series roots. And while well, at E3... We all got an answer to that. This disappointment felt by many fans led to a lot of interest surrounding the game dwindling, which is why many may not remember that yeah, Nintendo accidentally leaked the game two weeks before its release date. This one got wild. For those who placed a digital pre-order for the game for its slated October 7th release date, overnight two weeks prior, it was actually able to be downloaded. 
you could play through the entirety of the game if you got your hands on it at this time. Nintendo has the ability to take things down off the eShop, but going into your Wii U directly and removing your ability to play the game that you literally paid for and downloaded is not only pretty invasive, but is likely next to impossible to realistically do. The cat was out of the bag, the game was released, and it actually stayed up for several hours. You had a pretty decent chance of getting your hands on it, but why? Why did it leak, and not only that, why did it stay on the eShop for so long? Like the other stories we've talked about, the conspiracy theories came out surrounding this. It would make no sense to release the complete game early for Nintendo. It would completely screw up the ad campaigns and all the promotional material that they had planned. It could ruin relationships with retail stores who would look at this as Nintendo trying to get ahead of them by encouraging people to buy the game directly from them so they don't have to give the store a cut. All of these problems and more would arise from this one incident happening. But some still believe Nintendo leaked their own game on purpose and it was purely to generate some hype. Like I said, nobody was really caring about Color Splash around this time. Paper Mario fans were pissed that it wasn't in the original style that they knew. The larger general Nintendo fanbase saw the Switch on the horizon just a few months later. Like, who was gonna buy a Wii U to get this game if the people who already had the console probably weren't either? So if no eyes were on it already, how else could they help boost the buzz around this new game? Again, the Wii U didn't have too much stuff around this time, this was one of the bigger games that they had for it, so how could they get some eyes on it, and while doing it, also getting some early fan impressions out about the game, hoping that those who had a pre-order in were people that were likely already excited about it and more likely to spread positivity, instead of the review audience on the fence who would have probably been like, yeah, it's what we thought, this sucks. This was a theory that some would believe, but after digging deeper, I believe the real reasons why this game was leaked are actually much simpler and kind of funny to be honest. Remember how the game was set to be completed five months before it ended up coming out? Like that's a long time to hold off on a game releasing, but Nintendo has proven multiple times over the years that for one reason or another they'll often have games finished and ready to release in advance, that'll just be held up in case a gap in the schedule comes up or something. Data miners had determined that around the time that this announcement was made, the game actually had its internal release time automatically set for five months later. This was the time that Nintendo put in so that nobody would have to be there at the exact time it was supposed to come out on release day and just push the button. It's just, uh, the only problem is they put the wrong date in. Yes, the date was set for the game's release two weeks early, and this really shows more than anything else I feel how much Nintendo cared about the Wii U and its software at this time. Because no one noticed this! The game automatically released overnight and the reason it stayed up for hours and hours is likely because nobody with the clearance to deal with the issue was working during that time. This one is so crazy to me, like how did Nintendo actually let this happen? They later put out a formal statement apologizing in the whole deal, they treated it like a serious issue, but you know if this was Pokemon, or if this was Breath of the Wild at the Switch launch, like a major major game, you'd have someone double, triple checking that date every day, there would be no possible chance that this would be allowed to happen. But the game would come out, receive another mixed response, and we promptly forgot about it soon after. But at least it came out because there was another game that got leaked that wasn't as lucky. A game that may just not have never came out, but many believe never actually existed at all. And those in that camp may actually be right. When Reggie retired as the head honcho of Nintendo of America, fans were pretty disappointed that we wouldn't be seeing, well, this type of material any longer. But good for him moving on, and when he was leaving he posted a series of photos of his office and in one of them, something slipped that kinda went under the radar. Do you see it? What do you mean, of course I don't see it, what are you even talking about? Oh, oh, wait, wh what is that? On his desk was a signed original piece of artwork from the developer Retro Studios. They're famous for working on some Metroid Prime games and reviving the Donkey Kong Country series as well, so it makes sense as to why those characters are in the pick. But, uh, what's lying there behind that gold Mario amiibo? Some would notice that this hand resembles that of the Rob64, the robotic operator behind Team Star Fox's mothership. But, um, Retro Studios never made a Star Fox game before. What reason would they have to put anything Star Fox related in this pick? Let alone a pretty obscure character at that, and what would have Reggie feel the need to coincidentally put this gold Mario right in front of it? Only a part of it sticking out. Maybe we weren't actually supposed to see this. Oh boy, we're getting into the conspiracy territory already, but this one is going to be at another level, because this is just the tip of the iceberg. 
To find out why this little detail really matters, we need to go back to 2018, where a leak surfaced that Retro Studios was actually working on their own Star Fox game, Star Fox Grand Prix. It would be a racing game with a hub world like Diddy Kong Racing and actually have boss battles, all in the classic Star Fox style and aesthetic. This sounded really cool to me and honestly made so much sense for one reason. Star Fox, um, hadn't been doing so hot around this time. I love the joke and meme on the franchise sometimes with Zero being like the easiest material to jab at since the Virtual Boy, but deep down, I genuinely have a ton of great memories playing Star Fox 64. And it does make me a bit sad to see that in new entries of the series, they either swing in a completely different direction and it ends up either not working out because fans of the original style don't like the change, or they stick way too close to that classic style to the point where there's essentially nothing new to bring new fans in. This is where Retro Studios comes in. They were able to take a series that was already established in 2D with Metroid and innovate it so perfectly so that when the series went 3D, not only did it bring in new fans with the third dimension, but it also appealed to those who liked the original style. Donkey Kong is a similar thing with Country, they brought the series back after a long dormant period and made some games up there with the greatest in series history, again mixing the necessary new material with what made the originals on the SNES work in the first place. And Star Fox of all franchises, I think we can agree desperately needed a move like this. Yeah, they're bringing back the flying and the shooting and the boss fights that we all loved, but the innovation would be making it a racing game, a new style. What about Mario Kart but in space with fighter jets? I mean, if that doesn't sound at least interesting, then I don't know what does. So with this being leaked and backed up by multiple accounts, it seemed inevitable. It made too much sense. So we wait, and we wait, and we wait, and... We're picking up a distress call in the Atlas Star System. Huh. In the February 2019 Nintendo Direct, we received an announcement that shocked many. Starlink Battle for Atlas, a game that had released the year prior with Star Fox content in the Switch versions as a cool collaboration, would be getting an update called Crimson Moon, showing off new Star Fox characters, missions, and yes, racing. Was this supposed to be Star Fox Grand Prix all along? Was there a mix-up with the sources of the leakers? Did someone get shown this and interpret it as a new game by mistake? It remains unclear, but one would think that this would be the case. I mean, it makes some sense, it's just, uh, Starlink was developed by Ubisoft and Virtuos, not Retro Studios. So, what's up with that? If you were gonna leak something, and almost assuredly you'd want to be credible so that people believe you in the future, why would you just lie about knowing who the developer was when that detail didn't need to be included? You could've just leaked that a Star Fox racing game was gonna come out in the future. It led to many believing that Star Fox Grand Prix was something completely different, and still could be on the way. But as we go further, something crazy emerges that I don't think anyone could have expected. Retro Studios hasn't developed a new game since 2014 with Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze for the Wii U. They worked on the Switch port in 2018, but that certainly didn't take 4 years of work. We did get that funky mode though, this guy makes everything better, right? But something else needed to be worked on during that time. It's not like the company went under or something like that. This was a proven studio that Nintendo loves, and they were undoubtedly given a secret project just with this extra task on the side. But in January of 2019, a shocking announcement was made that the big E3 reveal of two years prior, Metroid Prime 4, would be restarting development, with the team being assigned to the task being none other than Retro Studios. What? The story behind the original Metroid Prime 4's development and things going so bad that a restart was forced to happen is a story in its own right, and I hope we find details on it in the years ahead. But the fact was that no matter what the circumstances were, Nintendo was backed into a corner at this time. For whatever reason, things were going so bad that for this big new game that they had promised, it had to be completely torn apart and started anew. And who else to hand the reins to than the people who created the first three games in the series? The new studio they chose didn't get the job done, and Retro was now tasked with bringing to life one of Nintendo's biggest games for the future of the Switch era. Nintendo seemed to have been panicking here, and basically just told Retro, um, we need someone to develop this, and we need it now. This is your task, and it seems like whatever they had been developing from 2014 up until that point had been completely scrapped, as to this day, we still haven't seen it. Now Retro is infamous for cancelled projects, so it wouldn't surprise many to see another one bite the dust. And if you're a Star Fox fan, it may disappoint you to hear that all accounts seem to point to this cancelled game being Star Fox Grand Prix. 
all hope is lost. Metroid fans cost the Star Fox fans their potential big break of a game to revive their favorite franchise, or did it? As there's another theory that made the rounds online in early 2020. Reports began to emerge of Star Fox Grand Prix actually never existing at all, believe it or not. The idea was that Nintendo faked the existence of this game to try to catch who was leaking things in the organization, to find out who they could trust and who they could not. Star Fox's newest big game didn't actually exist, and it was a product of privacy protection for the big end. Maybe they used images of Starlink in their leak and told those involved that the big mystery game that Retro was working on was indeed a new Star Fox. It made perfect sense to fill this gaping hole. But not everyone agreed with these reports. Other industry insiders disagree with the idea that this game never existed. There was said to be, quote, a lot more to the story than that. And with none of this being completely confirmed by Nintendo, fans are left scrambling as to what to think here. What can we believe and what is completely off? So let me have a go. Alright, so the glaring mystery remains as to if not Star Fox Grand Prix, then what exactly was Retro Studios working on before they got the task to do Metroid Prime 4? Some reports said that, quote, some kind of RPG involving singing as the main mechanic was the game in question. And, uh, it wouldn't surprise me that this didn't exactly take priority over Metroid Prime 4. But it's still a rumor, and there were some other ideas that made the rounds as well, with nothing quite being taken as definitive by the fanbase. And even if one was proven as correct, this was still four years. And if the studio was working on smaller projects like that around this time, kinda like the Tropical Freeze port, that on its own cannot completely discount the idea that Star Fox Grand Prix was being worked on at one point. And I actually think that it was. Assuming this game did actually exist at one point, we have it beginning development around the end of Star Fox Zeroes. At that point, they probably didn't know how much of a flop it was going to be, and then, uh, well, we certainly found that out. But they still wanted to have something in the works just in case for some reason that this game ended up saving the Wii U. While this is going on, we get the release of Starlink Battle for Atlas, which also didn't do as well, being one of the last Toys to Life games ever released. When you kill off an industry with your game, you know something's wrong. But with back-to-back -back failures for Star Fox to bring in the numbers, maybe that's when Nintendo realized that it wasn't worth it for them continuing to make this full-fledged game. They already have Mario Kart as their best-selling flagship racing game. If anything, a Star Fox racing game may conflict with that in some way. Kind of like the logic of not making Mario Kart 9 for the Switch and instead just releasing DLC for the game that people already owned. The decision was likely made to just add this concept of racing to Starlink since it was already out and would be way easier. The idea of the fake leak could come out of Nintendo feeling like, hey, if we're going to be scrapping this game that Retro's been working on, we might as well get some information out of it. So that goes down. Retro's already been working on bringing Tropical Freeze back by this time, so that explains that. And maybe even for some of that time in later 2018, this unknown singing game was being worked on too. When they found out that someone was needed for Metroid, Retro didn't have a major project going on, and they got tasked with crafting this new game. With this theory, we cover almost all the bases, the reports that it was real, the reasons why it was scrapped, why some believe it never existed because of the way Nintendo chose to leak the game's existence, what Retro was doing before Metroid Prime 4, and why racing was added to Starlink. Oh, and that Reggie picture kind of makes some sense now too. The great thing about this theory though is, even though I believe it, everything could be entirely wrong. The game may have actually never existed, but be it Nintendo's desire to strengthen its internal security, inputting the wrong launch date, or trying to temper expectations before a controversial announcement, they seem to leak their own games time and time again. They're no strangers to controversy, kind of like a feature in Smash 4 that many believe Nintendo was forced to remove, and the real reasons for that were pretty wild. You're going to want to find out why custom moves will never be seen again. The story being more tragic than you may think.